Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to this evening's um, local group online talk. My name is Harriet and I work for the Leicester Shrimwood and Wildlife Trust and this evening I am joined by the Charmwood local group. Um, so before I hand over to them to get started, um, just a couple of things to go over. Um, so we've got two talks this evening. Um, if you could put any questions you have throughout the talks um, in the Q&A box, and then um, Kate will go through a couple of questions at the end of her talk. Um, and then at the end of Dave's talk, we'll go through a couple of questions for his talk and any other questions that come up. Um, and what else was I going to say? Oh, and uh, we're delighted to be able to offer these talks for free. But if you'd like to give us a donation to help support the work that we do and um, help us to be able to continue to put on these talks for free, please head to our website at lrwt.org.uk forward slash donate. And you can also find lots of information about our local groups on there if you don't know anything about them. Um, I will share those links in the chat box as well so that you can check them out. Okay, um, without further ado, I shall pass over to Dave to get this evening going. Right, well, hi everybody and um, thanks for coming along. Welcome to our first Charmwood Group Talk of 2022. Um, for those that uh, I haven't met yet, I'm Dave Robinson, the current chair of the uh, Charmwood Local Committee. Uh, tonight, we were hoping to hold this meeting face to face in the Woodhouse Eves Village Hall, like we have done for many, many years. But uh, with the latest surge in COVID, we thought it was more prudent to, at least for now, uh, carry on online. Um, before we start, just a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, on Tuesday, the 15th of February, we're planning a walk around the Attenborough Nature Reserve, now, of course, uh, owned by the Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. So anybody that would like to join us on that is more than welcome. Uh, details will be going up on the uh, Trust website uh, very shortly, and uh, you will be asked just to register an interest on that. Uh, so we have some idea of the numbers that are coming. Um, the second thing I wanted to say, and it's looking into the future a little bit, is that on the, um, the 9th of March, Wednesday the 9th of March, we will be holding our AGM. Now, uh, we're lucky to have Hazel Graves giving a talk that evening on uh, plant goals. It's an area that we haven't really covered very much before. Um, but we will be having the AGM too. And I'll just put a call out now for, we're always looking for new committee members. So if anybody would like to join our friendly, happy band of uh, committee members uh, on the Charmwood group, um, you'd be more than welcome. Uh, if you are interested, uh, I think John Spencer and Kate's details are up on the website there. So please get in touch with them to find out a little more and ask any questions you might have. But um, we'd um, be delighted to have some fresh blood in the, uh, in the committee. So um, without more ado, we, we'll get straight on. We've got two short talks tonight. Um, firstly, Kate will be telling us about uh, adventures in the uh, Shetland Islands, uh, Shetland summer. Um, following that, I'll be giving a run through of our experiences in Belize in the Americas. So without more ado, let me just pass you over to Kate. I, Kate's very well known amongst all the naturalists in Leicestershire. Um, she's been for many years now, our programme organiser um, on the Charmwood Group Committee and organised us some really splendid talks. So uh, it's Kate's turn tonight. So uh, can I hand over to you, Kate, to uh, uh, tell us about Shetland, your Shetland summer? Uh, you're muted, Kate. Right, hello. Sorry, everyone. Yes, I haven't managed to unmute. Let me just try and do a screen share. And then if I do that, hold on. there we go. You should be able to see uh, my slides there. Um, I don't know if John and Dave, you want to take your video off. I don't know if that would help. Um, let's have a look. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, 
and uh, thank you for joining us for uh, the first talk uh, we've done as the Chana group for a little while. We've had these two, two talks, uh, as Dave said, one by myself and one by Dave, so hopefully about uh, 30 minutes each, um, but I can't promise not to overrun. I'm just checking my time there. Um, this is a talk um, I put together after a wonderful uh, summer uh, holiday last year as near overbroad as I could get under circumstances up in uh, Shetland. Um, so it was in uh, July, um, just after the longest day when I arrived there, um, but it was nearly 24 hours of light with very little darkness at all. Um, but there, what I'm going to do is try and go through mainly the wildlife um, and perhaps a little bit about geology and, and so on on the island. This is, as I say, it's about half of a, a full length talk that we're given, which includes quite a bit more. But I'll give you a bit of a, an introduction first to Shetland. So where are the Shetland Islands? About uh, 150 miles north of the, of, uh, of the Scotland uh, mainland. Uh, it's a 12 hour crossing from Aberdeen on the ferry. Um, and you end up at, as you can see it says here, at around 60 degrees north. Um, so as far north as you can get in, in the UK. Uh, Shetland consists of an archipelago of about 100 islands, but only 16 are actually inhabited. Um, the total population of the islands now is around 23,000. So um, can you... Can you see my, uh, I was just seeing if you can use the arrow. If you can see my arrow here, you've got the, the mainland, which is the largest island in Shetland. Um, and I spent about a week or so um, around the mainland in different places, with a, with, mainly with a group of friends. And then I took the ferry for another few days through Yale up to Unz, which is the, the most Northerly Island um, had three nights there, um, and then a night on Fetler, and then back to the mainland again. So I covered three, really three of the main islands in the group. Quick history: um, it's uh, there are many, many archaeological sites uh, throughout, scattered throughout Shetland, some dating back what's that, six thousand plus years. Um, most interesting features I find are a feature called the Brocks, which are these stone towers, which I'll talk about a little bit later when I show you one that I visited. Um, of course, um, they have a, a lot of Viking heritage, um, but then in the 14th century, they're reclaimed by Scotland and the UK. But more modern history, Unfortunately, there's been a very high rate of homicide that's been uh, talked about through the TV series Shetland. Um, all fictional, uh, luckily, uh, but some of you might have seen some of the lovely scenery if you've watched the series. The basic economy, um, fishing, obviously, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later. Uh, agriculture, uh, which used to be small holdings or croftings, um, but now there's a lot of sheep farming. Uh, energy, um, at Sullenbo in particular, um, North Sea oil and gas, uh, but increasingly renewables and uh, wind farms are popping up everywhere. Creative industries, uh, craft industry, tourism, which has suffered obviously through COVID, but um, is, is opening up again. And more recently, um, there's uh, plans to put a, a UK space launch site on the very north of Unst. Um, but what I'm really going to be talking about tonight is the nature and wildlife. Um, if you go back to ground level um, or sub ground level, the geology uh, around Shetland is absolutely stunning from these wonderful um, arches. This one's um, on uh, Noss Island. Um, it has three national nature reserves, all of which I'll talk about um, to different levels. Hermaness, which is in the north of Unst, 
Nuff, which is uh, a small island uh, not far from Lerwick, the capital, um, and the Keen of Hamar, which is fascinating if you're a botanist, um, really interesting area. Um, the flora in many areas is quite alpine. Um, uh, there are some substantial seabird colonies, which I'll dwell on quite a lot, and of course, Shetton ponies. Um, which uh, were bred or were taken over for uh, going down coal mines in the UK. Um, the mainland was uh, where I spent uh, quite a bit of the first week, um, staying in a place here called Sandwick. Lerwick is the main capital where the, the ferries land. Thumba is the most southerly point um, of the, uh, the Shetland, the Shetland Islands. Um, and I'll talk briefly about St Ninian's Isle and, of course, Eshinus in the, the north here. Lerwick I'll dwell on briefly because we're more interested in getting outside of, of the towns, although you can see otters swimming quite happily off the shore here, and there's um, a halt in the main harbour, which is off to the, the east of this picture. This is views you come in on the ferry from Aberdeen. Of Lerwick, which is the current capital of the Shetland Islands. I was staying further south in this lovely little annex on uh, in Sandwick, um, and that was the view from the front door. Um, this lovely coastal view, and the island off the shore there is the island of Musa. Um, in the the harbour there, or in the the bay there, uh, family of eider ducks, seals, the occasional otter. Um, so you didn't really have to go very far to see lots of, of wildlife um, straight from the front door set. Um, ferry, the little uh, small ferry going over to Musa goes from a jetty about 100 yards from where I was staying. And the most famous thing on Musa are, is this rock, which is um, rocks were built between uh, 400 BC and about 140, 150 BC. Um, they were used for uh, dwelling um, and had several stories. Um, then there's still a lot of uh, unknown about rocks. Um, they are fascinating um, areas, obviously used as habitation, but some of the construction features aren't still understood. Um, particularly some of the roofing structures and so on, and how it actually fitted together. However, today um, the rocks are actually inhabited not by people, um, but um, by another creature. Now I'm going to put a little quiz on here. I'm going to play a sound, and in the chat box, um, I'd like you to put as quickly as possible what you think this sound belongs to. So I'm having to play this. So, anyone knows what that noise belongs to? So, if anyone knows the answer, please put your answer in the chat. There's one answer gone in. We've got a suggestion here of uh, bats and then several of storm petrel, Kate. Yeah. Excellent. So the people who know it's uh, a storm petrel. Um, so at night, at dusk, uh, you go over to the rock and you hear that noise multiplied many, many times as the birds um, come back from feeding. Some of them come back to feed their chicks and they're basically uh, nesting in the walls. And there may be several hundred pairs of birds in these walls and they will do a changing of the guard and the male may come back with food and the female go out, but that is the call that they use to find their chicks in amongst um, the, the stones there. And it's, it's just an amazing sound um, to, to hear that at night. So there's our, our storm petrel. They breed there um, mainly sort of months of late April through to July. Um, and then they'll be going back out to sea and they spend most of the uh, rest of the year um, out at sea further south off the coast of, of Africa. Fascinating little birds there. Um, about the size of a, a swift, 
Um, similar to a swift, they can't walk on land. Um, they are one of the tube nose, so um, they have this sort of uh, tube on the um, tip of their beak, which often sort of exudes this really um, sickly, fishy smell. Um, and uh, they're probably more closely related to the, they're quite closely related to the albatross. Fascinating birds indeed. Um, right, moving on. Um, this is a, another of the arches, uh, again on Musa, um, and I was happily having lunch there, just looking at the arch over, overlooking the sea, and this little wheat here wouldn't let be. It was every time I moved to get out of its territory, it would move along with us. So I'm not sure quite where it was nesting, but it seemed to have a really big territory that um, I was invading at the time uh, and was trying to see me off most of the time on, on the island there. Further along the cliffs on um, Musa, and you have this lovely sight of these shag nests on the, on the cliff tops. The cliffs are where a lot of uh, seabirds obviously breed and, and raise their chicks. Um, and here's a couple of uh, shag chicks. I didn't quite get the picture of the, sh the chick with its, throat, its head right down its parents' throat, begging for food and trying to get the, uh, the adult to uh, regurgitate fish. Um, but that's near enough anyway. Um, moving on from Musa further south, uh, headed to Sumbra uh, with the lighthouse, uh, the airport is at Sumbra. Uh, and to get there, you have to cross the bottom of the runway. So if, if there's a flight taking off, all the cars stop. So the cliffs are dotted. It's not the biggest of the seabird colony, but you can see the little dots of white with various seabirds nesting just below the, the lighthouse. Um, both this and another lighthouse uh, I'll mention later on were designed and built by the father and uncle of Robert Louis Stevenson, Treasure Island fame, which is probably where I get some of his stories from. But a lot of those white specks are these wonderful creatures. They're the tummy nori, uh, the puffin, and I'll be talking much more about those when I get up to Unst. That's the first view, and very easy views you get of, of puffins from the Sumbra head. Uh, and puffins, again, don't walk very well, so just to take off with jump, they literally just jump off the cliff and, and fly. They're burrowing creatures, um, but again, I'll talk a little bit uh, more about uh, the tummy nori later on. Uh, this bird you often see uh, with very straight wings flying off the off cliff tops. It's a fulmar. Fulmars aren't actually gulls, although they might represent gulls. Again, they're another tube nose, very much more akin to an albatross. You can see the tube on the nose there. Um, and oh, I think they're wonderful uh, birds and they will eye you up if, the, if they hover in the wings and fly in the wind or off the cliff top. This is a black guillemot. I'll show you some pictures of um, the guillemot later. Unlike uh, its cousin though, the black guillemot um, is more of a solitary uh, bird and doesn't really nest in, in big colonies. There are they're smallish colonies, but not the same, but they have these wonderful, wonderful red feet. So that's the, the black guillemot. And just south of, sorry, just north of uh, Sumbra Head itself is this most wonderful settlement of the Arlshof. Well worth a, worth a visit if you go to Shetland, if you love archaeology. You can see a timeline right through from 4,000 years ago uh, in the Bronze Age, right through to almost a modern day farm um, and visitor centre here. And the timeline is right in front of you. And the archaeology and the way it's displayed is fantastic because they dug out in the past, follows you, follow, follows different settlements through time as you wander from Bronze Age site right through the path uh, to this medieval site. And then there's another farmhouse as well. It's quite fascinating. Further north again, um, another geological feature, which is uh, the biggest one in the UK. There's lots of the biggest and the best on Shetland. This is a tombolo, not a tombola, a tombolo. 
and it's a bit of land joining a mainland to an island. And basically the, the land or the, the sandbank, if you like, is constructed by the tide and the waves on either side, just pushing the sun together. So it's got equal force of, of the wave action either side that creates this sandbank, or, or in some cases it will be a gravel bank. And here it is the biggest sandbank in the world. This is about half a kilometre wide. You can walk along the top to the island. So that's a, a tombolo at St Ninian's Isle. And St Ninian's Isle is an old chapel. Um, again, a really interesting archaeological site there. And that's a, another view of this, this wonderful tombolo. Uh, fascinating natural feature um, on Shetland. Of course, you can't go to Shetland without seeing Shetland ponies. These um, are, were bred on Shetland um, for, unfortunately, for uh, coal mining uh, activities on the mainland of the UK until um, they were protected. And now they're, they're basically domesticated pets for the most part. But very gorgeous, beautiful creatures that you see, and they sort of enhance the landscape wherever you go. Right, further north on, on the mainland, um, as you're travelling through, you suddenly come to this really narrow strip of land called Navy's Grin. And the picture in the middle here, on the left-hand side, to get this the right way around, is the North Sea. On the right-hand side is the Atlantic, and it's a matter of a few hundred yards across this strip here. Now, the, in older days, the Shetlanders used to use this as a shortcut. So if they were sailing the boats from, say, the south of the mainland and they wanted to get over to the other side, instead of, you know, spending an extra day at sea, sailing right around the, the northern tip of Shetland um, or the mainland, they would actually just haul the boats, as you can see in the bottom picture there, they would actually get the boats out and haul it across uh, that narrow strip of land. Now, as you cross Mavis Green going north, you come into an area of land called North Mabine. Um, Shetland started its geological life somewhere near the Antarctic um, and gradually sort of moved north through uh, continental drift until it's right up towards the Arctic Circle. Um, but the geology there shows every age of geology, and you've got uh, volcanic features, you've got sedimentary features, um, and uh, metamorphic features, which where the, the uh, volcanic activity or, or natural activity will change the nature of the rocks. And that can be seen in this outcrop, well, it's not an outcrop, it's a built outcrop here showing the different types of rock that you will find literally as you go north. Uh, and it's quite fascinating to see that in, in the landscape. So further north, one of the volcanic areas that is particularly fascinating for uh, see the um, geomorphology over time is at Eshenes, these wonderful sea cliffs that were actually represent, just like we are in Leicestershire in, in Charnwood, they represent uh, the edge of the volcano. And these are lava flows that have been eroded slowly by the sea. And the landscapes and the cliffs along uh, the Eshenes coast are some of the most dramatic in Shetland. Um, so the waves have over time have slowly, slowly eroded. Um, and there's a lot of uh, sea caves and collapsed sea caves. Again, this is the side of a volcano that you can see that's been eroded in the lava flows, uh, the lava activity there. And then you have caves that are collapsed, which leads to long inlets and features like this. I was there on a calm day. I would love to go back on a really rough day to so here and see what's going on um, on, on that lovely coast. Again, another wonderful um, arch, natural arch that's been eroded away on the Eshenes coast. And then further offshore, these fantastic uh, sea stacks um, right out to shore, right out shore, off the shore. It's absolutely stunning um, area to, to visit. 
There's a lovely footpath around the edge and um, bird activity both along the edge, but more interestingly along the moorland as you're coming back, if you do the circular path to the lighthouse and back, it's fantastic. So you've got uh, oyster catchers, uh, ringed plover, and most of these are nesting just inland, the, the red shank, um, and one of my favourite is the wimbrel. Um, this particular wimbrel wouldn't let us be, we were crossing over his territory and he followed us for about a quarter of a mile making the most tremendous noise, um, trying to say go away, go away. Um, and uh, the difference between wimbrels and curly is one of the main differences, this lovely dark eye stripe and the light, the, um, uh, a light area just above his eye. And also the beak tends to be slightly straighter and, and at, the, uh, at the base um, than a curly. Um, right, moving on, I'm going back towards uh, Lerwick here and just off Lerwick are two islands, the big ice island of Gresse, but the smaller, most amazing island of Nos, which is one of the National Nature Reserves. Um, and it's one of the biggest, has one of the biggest organic colonies um, in the, the UK. To get there, you have to book ahead and get a, an inflatable. The warden on NOS will come over and fetch you. Um, so it's limited how many people go over to NOS each day. Uh, in the channel there, here's a red-throated diver. Um, and then you're greeted on NOS um, by this whale skeleton. Sorry, I can't tell you exactly what sort of whale, um, but it indicates uh, what's happening. You're also greeted by these fellas. These are the bully boys uh, of uh, the north, if you like. These are great skewers or bonkses as they're locally known. And many times you see them, they're, they're, they're scavengers, but many times the, the way you see them is heading straight for you if, if you're too near to their nest. They will come and dive bomb you and I'll have a little bit more of that later. The other bird that will dive bomb you quite readily. Uh, not a very good photograph. I was too busy trying to get away most of the time from these, these deer. These are um, Arctic terns um, and uh, sorry, the Arctic terns or the Tyric uh, as they're known locally. But round on Nos, uh, I both walked around it and got a boat around it, so there's a mixture of pictures here. This is um, a guillemot colony on the lower cliff. Um, guillemots are actually the most numerous uh, breeding seabird in the UK, although you perhaps wouldn't think so. So, the, so after they've bred, they spend most of their time at sea, resting on the sea. There you go. Very closely uh, allied to a razor bill, but they, they are the guillemots. But this is what you come to see, these amazing uh, gannet cliffs. And all of these cliffs are covered with gannet nests. You start to see them here, little specks around. And as you zoom in, you can start to see uh, the breeding uh, gannets. Uh, you can see a chick just in the middle there. There's a closer picture of a pair of gannets uh, with the chick. A few, few um, pictures here. Some of these now are taken from the boat. These are three year old. Gannets, so they, they make little juveniles, not juveniles, sorry. They're a bit like um, teenage colonies, if you like, in, in, in human terms. So these are three year old birds that congregate together before they start breeding. I love the plumage on, on three year old uh, gannets, uh, it's very, very striking. Um, and slowly, until about the 40th, they start breeding in their fifth calendar year. Um, so these are pre-breeding birds. But in the same cliff, look at the wonderful guano patterns on here. And this is a, a breeding uh, gannet with its chick. Uh, but increasingly the nest's not just composed of seaweed, but more and more of uh, fishing line and nylon line um, that they use to, to help build some of their, their nests. 
So I took a, a boat out to see these colonies, and most of the way, uh, this bonkie was following the boat, uh, coming in quite close, obviously looking for something, and we were being followed all the way around the island by both the bonkies and the um, uh, gannets. And this is the reason, because about halfway around, when we were underneath the gannet, gannet cliff, the, um, the guide stopped the boat and started feeding uh, the gannet. And literally, this is what happened. We were surrounded by these wonderful diving birds. Now, the gannet is incredible. It uh, can dive up to about 100 kilometers an hour uh, at maximum speed. It dives probably to, uh, start that again. Uh, it can dive up to about uh, 30 meters. Um, the Shetland name for the gannet is the Solon or Solon, I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced. And then you've got the bonkies coming in to steal fish from the gannets themselves. It was quite a spectacular spectacle and, and even the bonkies would come and hand feed from the, the guide or the boat driver. Here they are all scrapping for food. There's a, a great black back girl in, in the mayhem there as well. There you go. Um, but fantastic. If you ever get the opportunity to take one of the boat trips out around the, the edge of not not uh, not. So Quick quiz, but I'm not going to take answers. I'll just give the answers in a minute. Can you, in I'll give you ten seconds, name what, uh, say what these are in English? The Tammy Norrie, the Bonksy, the Solan, and the Tyric. I've talked about all of them, so I'll give you just a second or two and quickly write down what they are. Okay, not got a lot of time, so I'll go through them. Tammy Nori is the puffin, Bonksy is the great skewer, Solan is the gannet, and the Tyric is the Arctic tern. So, the next part of my holiday uh, was in the northern island of Wunst. I had ferries uh, from the mainland across Yale and then from Yale over to Unz. You book ahead, it's 15 pounds that you pay on the boat one way in cash. Um, the card reader doesn't always work, so you have to take the cash. Um, and I stayed here, right in the north of Unz, which I'll show you in a minute, near Haraldswick, which is the main town on Unz. And I was told, watch out at the ferry terminals, because that is one of the best places to see the Drapsi or the Otter in Shetland and sure enough there as soon as I got to the first ferry there was the otter feeding just off the ferry terminal. You have to be quite lucky sometimes to see otters they're still fairly elusive but you do well, you see them when you least expect it. There's a rock pipit just looking at the action and then this is my destination so I spent three nights in this building here which is now I get this right it's a tongue twister it's Muckle Slugger Lighthouse Shore Station, which is now a series of apartments, one of which it had an Airbnb. An artist ran an Airbnb where you slept basically in his studio, he cleared all the artwork out and, and uh, turned it into a, a room for any visitors. There's four apartments in on this shore station, and what a wonderful place uh, to stay just over the cliff. Uh, the headland here um, is uh, Hermines, uh, the other another natural nature national nature reserve. Twenty five minutes, Kate. I know. Well, I'm I'm going to go over a little bit. I'll do the best I can, Dave. Thanks. Um, and this is a photograph from my room at about one o'clock in the morning. Remember, this is uh, the middle of the summer, and it doesn't really get dark. This is called the dimmer sim in the, the Shelty, uh, Shetland language. Lots of archaeology, standing stones, um, Viking boats, reconstructed Viking boats and, and Viking set, um, uh, a Viking longhouse, which you can visit. Um, so lots more to see around Haraldswick and around the area. 
But again, I really wanted to, uh, oh, sorry, I will just briefly talk about crofting. Uh, the, the traditional way of uh, living on Shetland is crofting small areas, small farms um, with shared grazing land. Uh, but unfortunately, through clearance, uh, most of these are now derelict. Um, uh, they were used probably up until about the 19th century, but most of them now you will find in, in this state. Uh, traditional means of living at the crofting is um, fishing, farming, um, and living off the land really. And still today, because there are very few trees these days on Shetland, they used to be, but they, they've been cleared mainly for sheep farming. But a lot of the fuel is still uh, heat cutting, but it's done in a um, because it's it's small, it is the only form of, of local fuel and it's still done quite considerably today to heat some of the smaller houses. The other main industry, particularly in Unz, was herring fishing and it was one of the biggest, or it's the most, ma the major herring port uh, could be found on Unz up until uh, the, the sort of early 20th century. And Bolter Sound in particular, one small town now um, on the east coast of Unz, um, it, its population would grow from about 500 um, most of the year until the herring season when it would grow to about 10,000 and fishermen and women who wanted to get away and young girls who wanted to earn some money would go uh, and live and work from the town of, of Bolter Sound. Um, unfortunately, herring stocks have gone and it's all big commercial fishing now. Uh, but it must have been quite a sight uh, in Unst. So what I really will go through, uh, this is the main part of this part of the talk, is, is Hermanus, uh, this headland in the north of Unst, and you cross over this wonderful, barren, mossy moorland, um, and they have built a path to the other side of the cliff. You have to be aware of the bonkses that will come and attack you as you're walking over the headland and fly straight towards you. So you have to duck or carry a stick towards them off. You get Dunlin up on the, the Heathland. But on the other side, you start to see the sea. Um, uh, yeah. It's just a nice picture of a sheep with a raven. Uh, and from the other side, you can see Mucklefluger Lighthouse, again built by Robert Louis Stevenson's father and uncle, and most northerly lighthouse in the UK, um, a rocky outcrop off the sea. This is a gallant, Gannet colony um, just near there, uh, one, again one of the biggest in the UK. But what I was amazed by most was not necessarily the Gannets, but these chappies, the Taminari, the Puffins. Um, and I spent a happy two hours just sitting on the cliff top with puffins literally at my feet. Um, and they, they just think you're another sheep. If you stay still enough, they come right up. And they're the most wonderful characters. Um, they come in, they breed in holes, rabbit holes. They can dig the holes themselves. Uh, they pair for life. The average lifespan of a puffin is about 20 years. There was one recently recaptured on, I think it was on Stockholm. A scoma that was 37 years old um, from when it had been ringed. Um, the wonderful colourful bill, um, they only keep in breeding season. So in the winter season, the bill will just be black. They will lose that outer shed shell. Um, they, they feed mainly on sand eels, which are depleting. So there is a lot of problem now with puffins and other um, seabirds. Have you heard there's quite a lot of guillemots in particular been found washed up starving recently. So their, their stocks of food sadly are depleting very much in the North Atlantic. So they are the most wonderful birds to, to sit and watch and study just for an hour or so on the cliff top. Um, I took my bike. So I, I did a bit of cycling round. Uh, there's this wonderful bus stop on the north of Unst, 
um, that you can visit. There is a double decker bus there somewhere as well. And all through Shetland are these wonderful uh, cake fridges. So you just open the box and it's an honesty box and you can buy homemade cake. I did think I'd get got lost when I was cycling around this day. I suddenly found a sign, a sign for Skeggy. Um, but I was still in Shetland. I hadn't come back down to Lincolnshire by some sort of miraculous transportation. But on my cycling day, I visited another national nature reserve, the Keen of Hammer, which looks like that. And at first appearance, it's just a rocky slope. But in amongst all the gravel are some most amazing alpine plants. The one I didn't quite find, which is an endemic, is the Edmonstons chickweed. But there are quite a lot of other um, really interesting alpine plants around. Um, the one I did find was this northern rock crest that I could identify. Um, and in amongst that, there's a few plantains. Um, and it's all, although it's very barren rock, it's quite specific. It's, um, there's a lot of chromium um, and it's basically serpentine rocks. And although it looks quite barren and bare and dry, it's got a lot of interest in the flora. Uh, sorry, Dave, I know I'm going on. I'll, I'll just go. This is very, the last island I visited was Fekla. It was beautiful island, it's the Garden of Shetland. I went to see the redneck pallor oak, uh, which breeds there in these wonderful boggy, uh, mossy um, pools. I spent several hours looking and watching at that one and at that one. Um, and I probably missed the time that the female had, the female is a colorful one, um, they're quite promiscuous, they find a male, they mate, they lay their, their egg and then leave the male to do the housekeeping and go and find another mate. Um, so the mating season was over, so the male was hiding, incubating the nest and uh, the female had disappeared. Sadly, I didn't manage to catch sight of the, the redneck sparrow on this occasion. Uh, I did get excited at one point, thinking, oh, but no, it was a golden plover uh, in amongst the grass. Um, but I did find these chappies, which is a, a nest for a hooded crow. It's rather lovely. So this is about the end of my talk, just a couple more. Uh, the other thing I did in Settler and on the mainland, I did a little bit of, well, semi-wild camping. I had my car just around the corner, but I put my tent out. Um, on this beach and um, it was the most amazing bit of wild camping. Uh, this is another campsite. Watching the simmer dim, the simmer dim is that lovely evening light when it doesn't really get dark. So if any of you have got tents, go to Shetland, do a bit of wild camping and just soak up the atmosphere of otters and seals coming in to watch you as you put your tent out. And of course, I had to say goodbye with the bong. Bong to see. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thanks, Kate. That was uh, <laughs> that was excellent. A fascinating place. It's a place I've never been, and uh, it's very high on my uh, list of places to go to, particularly after what I've just heard. So. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for that. Um, I forgot to mention when you did your quiz with the uh, storm petrel there, that the, the first person to get the correct answer was Duncan McNeil. So oh, well, well, done. Well, well, well done, Duncan. That's uh, that's good. Um, we've got a any questions? We've not got any. Oh yes, uh, comments here. Thanks, Kate. We don't actually have any formal questions in the Q and A box. At the moment, no, so but, I'll uh, just carry on. Do you want to just carry on then, Dave? So I, I'll just carry on, and maybe if anybody, right at the very end, if we get time, I uh, can uh, come up with a few questions. Then we can handle them uh, all together. That'd be good. Right. Thanks, Kate. So I'll carry on now with. Um, okay. Well, I suppose if I introduce you, this is Dave, as you know. So he's going to now take over and talk about somewhere on the other side of the world in Belize, so over to you, Dave, now. Right, thanks, Kate. Right, we'll do a...
screen share. There we go. That, right. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So we're going to spin uh, a third the way around the world now to the Americas and talk a little bit about the wildlife of Belize. And uh, I put in brackets there Guatemala. We did spend a little bit of time in uh, Guatemala. So there'll be a little bit about that. Now, the first slide here is um, it's partly a bit of gratuitous colour, but it's actually also a plumage detail of one of the birds I'm going to be talking about. And um, a little bit like uh, Kate did a quiz, um, if anybody can spot at any stage of the talk what that bird is, then please just pop it in the, um, uh, the chat box. I was going to have a prize if we had a face-to-face -face meeting, but uh, I'm afraid that the only prize tonight's going to be brownie points. So uh, anybody can spot that as we go through at any stage, then uh, just pop it in the chat box. Now, the more senior members of uh, our group tonight, including me uh, in terms of age, will recognise um, Belize's British Honduras. It's uh, an old crown colony. Um, you can see here, this is actually a photograph from my first stamp album. And there's a couple of British Honduras stamps here with Queen Elizabeth uh, on the stamp there. Um, it was actually uh, one from the Spanish in 1840 after a big battle with the uh, Spanish there. And it finally gained its independence in uh, 1981. Now, one of the first reasons the British were interested in uh, British Honduras was because of the logging industry. And you can see on this older stamp uh, here, there's a chap uh, riding on some mahogany logs uh, down the river. Uh, fortunately, that's not quite done so much these days. And the main exports from uh, Belize are, in fact, now um, agricultural products, mainly sugar, actually, and also bananas, and uh, they have a, a very small oil industry too. This is the flag of Belize. The reason I've put it up there is to hark back to the logging industry again. You can see the emblem in the middle of the flag has a tree here and a, a fit looking young chap here with a, a big axe over his shoulder. And uh, on the trident of the shield here, we've got a, a picture of an axe. In the other one here, there's not only an axe, but a big double manned saw as well, which um, really harks back to the logging industry. But what I found particularly ironic about this is the Latin inscription at the bottom, sub umbra florio, which when translated into English means I flourish in the shade, which seemed to be rather a strange logo to have for um, uh, a country based on logging. Uh, too much logging, of course, they wouldn't have any shade to flourish in. Um, where is Belize? Well, it's Central America here. Here's a picture of Central America we're familiar with. Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, uh, Honduras, and Belize is right at the top here, bordering Guatemala and uh, Mexico at the top there. Zooming in on that top little bit there, the capital of Belize used to be Belize, Belize City. Uh, and um, the capital was swamped or pretty well destroyed actually by hurricanes twice within about 30 years in the early 1900s. So they moved the capital from Belize City to Belmapan. This is, was at the time anyway, kind of a new uh, town. You can see that there's lots of waterways in Belize, lots of rivers and lagoons and lakes. But one geographical feature I wanted to point out was this feature on the left here, this ring of islands actually forms the uh, Great Barrier Reef of Belize. And it's quite famous for being the second largest barrier reef in the world, second only to the one obviously on the uh, coast of Australia there. And as such, it's uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site on the basis of, uh, of this barrier reef. The um, route we took, we came into Belize via London Heathrow there. Uh, we traveled by road following these green lines up north uh, and a river trip here, quite a long river trip, took us to a, a, an encampment called Lamanai. Stayed there a few days, stopping various places on the way back through Belmapan, um, San Ignacio, and then up to Tikal in uh, Guatemala there, all the way back to Dan Griga uh, here uh, further south, and then back to Belize. Um, 
I've put circles around those two uh, towns there because they are both Mayan uh, civilization cities, um, very famous for the Mayan civilizations, of course, all around Guatemala and Belize. And I'll come back to them a little bit uh, later. The national flower of Belize, I'm not going to be talking about plants very much, but um, the national flower of Belize is the black orchid. And um, it's typical of some orchids in that it's uh, an epiphyte, um, but it's untypical in other ways in that whereas most orchids have a very short flowering period, this one actually flowers for months and months and months. And, um, you know, you could see it in various places in Belize. If you Google black orchid, the last thing you find is the flower, actually, because lots of advertisements for perfumes and restaurants and uh, lodges uh, appear on uh, Google there. And uh, even two episodes of Doctor Who uh, some years ago were called the Black Orchid. So uh, it's quite a long way down before you find very much about the flower uh, at all. Uh, our first trip there was a trip out to part of the Barrier Reef from Belize City there. And uh, the wildlife in that area was um, very splendid. We went for a snorkeling trip. And um, uh, when I put the camera up just to catch those um, frigate birds flying over there, um, just as I snapped the camera, uh, that cetacean uh, leapt out of the water and disappeared again. Um, the frigate birds there, there were loads and loads of them. Uh, they're the magnificent frigus, frigate bird. This is an immature, you can tell from the um, white face on it. There are also lots of males. The males have this red gular pouch here under the throat, which um, uh, many people might recognize as um, being one of the main breeding advertisement things that the male have. So during the breeding season, they pump air into this pouch and um, swell it up and uh, attract the, uh, the, 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 the females. And it's one of those cases where I think is that, that the bigger is the better. Keen bird watchers amongst you will recognize that this isn't actually the magnificent frigate bird. This photograph was taken on the Galapagos Islands. This is actually the great frigate bird. And you can tell by the uh, iridescent green sheen on the feathers there and the eyes slightly different too, but the uh, magnificent frigate bird has the same uh, gula pouch. Another uh, famous creature off this coast is the manatee um, mammal. Um, a sign here is asking uh, boats to take it easy and make sure they don't run into them. And the sign's being taken of advantage of by these two brown pelicans uh, there, which is quite good. And so we did see a number of manatees. They're not easy to get a good photograph of. Um, obviously, they're submerged under the water. They're a single uh, creature here. And here we've got a mother with a calf. But I pinched a photograph of the, of the internet just to show you uh, a little bit what they look like underwater, uh, the big her herbivorous uh, mammals, uh, they're sometimes called sea cows, and they're a little bit similar to the dugong, uh, another uh, creature like this. One of the main differences is that on the manatee, they have a, this rounded paddle-like tail, whereas the dugong has more of a, a, a fluke, a little bit like a, a whale. I mentioned the waterways uh, in Belize, plenty of waterways. This is the view out of the restaurant at uh, a lodge called the Black Orchid by coincidence, uh, the first one we stayed at. A lot of waterways and the uh, Belize Tourist Board saw fit to put some of these signs up all over the place. So beware, just to warn tourists of crocodiles and snakes. Uh, there are in fact two species of crocodile uh, in Belize, not that we actually came across any. Uh, tarpon, snook and crabs, Jesus Christ lizards, iguanas and frogs, monkey poop from above, otters and manatees, we've already talked about manatees, and various critters, uh, very American. Uh, I'll be speaking about a few of these later on. Much of our wildlife watching was done by um, boats, a uh, very good way of approaching wildlife. They seem to accept boats a lot more than they do people walking or in vehicles. So. Uh, some of the boats are electric powered, so they're very, very quiet. You can get very, very close to the wildlife without uh, disturbing them at all. This was our guide, Peter, uh, pointing at something there. 
I just talk about a few of the birds that we saw. This is the limpkin. It's a wading bird, uh, fairly restricted range actually to kind of Central America and not far uh, further. Um, it eats all kind of uh, creatures, but uh, its favorite diet is uh, snails, uh, the apple snail, very, very common in these parts. And the bill, you can't see it particularly clearly here, but when the bill's closed, it actually remains open just an inch or two back, a little bit like the open bill stalk of uh, Africa. And it's an excellent uh, pair of tweezers for pulling the um, snails out of the shells. Um, the call is a really weird wailing cry, and I understand it's actually been used as a soundtrack in some of the Tarzan films to give a bit of atmosphere. And if there are any Harry Potter fans out there, it's actually used for the call of the hippogriff as well. A um, little bit of trivia there. So that's the limpkin. It's the sole member of the family, uh, Aramidae, and uh, one of those examples where there's only one bird representing the whole family. Great egrets, uh, lots of great egrets around. These were kind of common birds in the UK several centuries ago. And of course, loss of habitat through fen drainage and hunting uh, made them extinct as a breeding bird. But it's great to see that they're actually coming back now. And there's been double figures at uh, Rutland Water uh, over recent times. They're a little bit unusual amongst the uh, herons and egrets in the uh, they all have an S-shape uh, neck, but the great egret, of course, has this strange kink. It looks like it's been broken and uh, remended again. And uh, it's due to this um, elongated sixth vertebrae. And it gives the uh, great egret much more thrust when it's uh, diving in for fish. And it always reminds me a little bit of the assegai, you know, the uh, device for uh, increasing the force of a, a spear throw. Snowy egret, much smaller egrets, it's almost the equivalent of our uh, little egret, this one, it has the black bill, and when it lifts its feet out of the water, it has the yellow feet, just like our little egret, but uh, there were plenty of snowy egrets around. One of my favourites is the cattle egret, we saw uh, dozens of them in flights, large flocks, and of course almost every uh, cow or horse you see uh, in the countryside will have one or two cattle egrets uh, following it around, uh, pecking up the insects that are disturbed by its feet. Beautiful birds. There's the little blue heron. This is, uh, again, quite a small heron. Um, one has to be a little bit careful, though, when one's scanning through uh, piles of egrets, because the young little blue heron is actually white. Here it is. Uh, and uh, it's easy to miss them uh, when you're scanning through through the birds, but you can see it's actually got quite different legs. These are green legs with uh, green feet. Black crown night heron, we get these in the UK uh, occasionally, of course. There was one at our local Thornton Reservoir about nine years ago, stayed there for quite a long time. Uh, what we don't get here quite so much, of course, are the yellow crown night heron. Uh, this quite different crown, obviously black on this one and yellow with the plume behind. Uh, smaller heron, but very attractive one. One we certainly don't get here is the brass-throated tiger heron. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Quite often, one of the highlights of these uh, foreign trips can be the night hikes and night safaris, if you like. And uh, again, you can approach quite closely to a lot of the birds on the water side, particularly as they're roosting. Uh, this is the green heron. It actually looks purple there, but it's got a love in the daylight. It's got a lovely green sheen on the, the wings. Um, I don't like using flash with wildlife. And this photo, well, all the uh, nighttime photos were taken just in the light of a torch. Uh, so they don't seem to mind torchlight as much as they <coughs> don't particularly seem to like flash. This is the Rufus Nate wood rail. Uh, again, um, Interesting bird, There's, it's really important to get a, an up-to-date bird book because the taxonomy changes quite a lot with uh, some of these birds here. Um, you can see why it's called Rufus Nape. It's got this lovely Rufus Nape. In my bird book that I took with me, uh, wasn't all that old, it's actually called this one the grey net uh, rail, or grey net wood rail. And um, 
a, been a lot of taxonomy work done on it, and it's now been given the title of uh, Aramides albiventris. So uh, at least we've pinned that one down now. Kingfishers, a few kingfishers in Belize. This is the female ring kingfisher. The male has red uh, or the browny colour right up to its throat there, but uh, a very obliging bird. And also the equivalent of our nightjar, the common parak. These would uh, fly around regularly and uh, you'd often find them outside your cabin in the lodges, just roosting when we were getting up before dark for a, a, an early morning walk. Uh, would disturb them. I love this one. This is the northern potu. There are lots of different potus around the world, of course. This is the northern potu. And look at that eye. It's absolutely gorgeous eye. Um, if it didn't have its eye open, uh, you'd actually think it was part of the tree. It's incredibly well camouflaged uh, with that plumage. And the Yucatan nightjar, another nightjar, uh, obviously. In this part of the world, there's an awful lot of things called Yucatan something or other. There's a Yucatan wren, a Yucatan flycatcher, Yucatan, all sorts of things, including the Yucatan jay. And these are beautiful birds and um, beautiful blue backs. The immature here has the very yellow bill and a yellow eye ring. As they become mature, the bill develops into a black one and the eye ring disappears. Uh, we came across a large flock of these. The brown jay um, uh, is a much more common bird. Um, and like all jays all around the world, they're very resourceful. Uh, this particular one is uh, helping itself to a drink from a garden tap or a faucet, as the Americans uh, like to call them. Lots of raptors. Uh, we came across a number of these snail kites around the watery areas, as their name infers they love uh, to eat snails. This is a, an immature or a, a young female, I think. But when you see them hunting, they look a little bit like, they hover a little bit and they look a little bit like our hen harriers with this um, ring tail, white ring there. Uh, the Northern Harrier, the American Northern Harrier also has that. But when they um, come down, you can see one here just Look, you can't see it all that well, but it's got a snail in its uh, talon there and uh, managed to catch a photograph of this adult male with uh, its prized trophy uh, ready to eat it. Lots of other wonderful raptors. Uh, like in most countries, we have uh, the osprey. Um, the, one of my favourites, actually, is the black collared hawk. Look at this one. It's a lovely white head, chestnut body with this uh, very black collar here. Um, the roadside hawk is almost our equivalent of the sparrow hawk. It has this rufous breast with the bars across it and a, a lovely falcon, the laughing falcon. This is a snake eating bird and um, it's called a laughing falcon because it has this ha 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 kind of call, which is quite resonant and carries a, a very long way. We all have bogey birds, don't we? And um, my bogey bird, my global bo bogey bird is the harpy eagle. Uh, well, we did visit um, a zoo in Belize um, where they specialised in endemic uh, uh, creatures and um, local creatures. Uh, all my other photographs, are, apart from maybe one or two that I'll highlight, are taken in the wild, but these two were in the zoo. Uh, absolutely wonderful birds. I've been various places looking for them. I spent a couple of hours standing under what was supposed to be a, an active harpy eagle nest some years ago and uh, never saw it. One of their favourite foodstuffs, they're very big birds, are monkeys, of course. They eat spider monkeys and they have these enormous great big uh, talons for picking the monkeys off. So um, hopefully one day when uh, Covid's gone, I might get a chance of a harpy eagle. Woodpeckers, quite a lot of woodpeckers. Um, in Belize, this is the acorn woodpecker. They seem to quite enjoy going to these electricity substation type things uh, and was able to capture a photograph of a, uh, an acorn woodpecker with an acorn, which was quite nice. Lots of other woodpeckers though. These two on the left look fairly similar, but they're different species. We've got the lineated woodpecker here and the pale billed woodpecker. Pale bill woodpecker notable has this um, red all the way around its eye, whereas the lineated tends to be black around the eye. Fairly subtle difference, but um, uh, fairly easy to tell the difference. Uh, the golden 
uh, breasted woodpecker and the golden, hang on, is that golden breasted? Golden fronted woodpecker anyway. And this, sorry, my thing's in the way. Yes, the golden olive woodpecker, that's right. And the golden fronted woodpecker. This is a female, the male has the red, comes right over to the front of the bill there. And a lovely, another lovely woodpecker, this is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And it's its name in furs, it um, drills holes in these trees and licks up the sap and they tend to be horizontal like this, so they'll make a row of horizontal uh, holes. This is either a female or a juvenile. The males have a, a, a red throat here. Um, I suspect it's a, a juvenile female actually because the uh, juveniles tend to have less red on the head here. So uh, anyway, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, looking at this lovely bird. But my favourite of the lot is this chestnut coloured woodpecker. This photograph was taken in uh, Guatemala in Tikal actually and uh, I stood watching this for quite some time uh, feeding uh, around this uh, fig tree. A few reptiles, this is the black iguana. I, I hope you can see it. This was taken from a boat and see how well camouflaged it is against this uh, piece of uh, wood here. Uh, has the, there's the head and the tail, and um, that's the black iguana, but they're also green iguanas. Now you might say, well, this doesn't look green. It's actually quite bright orange, and the green iguana uh, changes its colour with the, the male in the uh, breeding season to take on this lovely orange hue. Beautiful creature, and they're quite large. They're two to three feet long, these uh, uh, iguanas. The basilisk lizard, this is the alternative name, is the Jesus Christ lizard uh, that was on that warning sign a little bit earlier. And they tend to, um, the reason that they're called Jesus Christ lizards is they live near water. And when disturbed, they tend to run across the surface of the water without going in. And um, obviously the ability to walk on water uh, gives them the name. And a few other lizards, the rose-bellied lizard was right outside my lodge one day a rainbow amoeba, lots of frogs. This is the Stoffer's tree frog. The young ones, they were all over the walls of the restaurant we came out of one night and they're almost translucent. You can see the internal organs there. And the white-lipped foam frog, they uh, froth up lots of water to make a nest to lay their eggs in. One of our favourite reserves that we stayed in uh, was Pooks Hill Lodge. Uh, the accommodation was in these uh, thatched individual uh, roundhouses here. And when the owner was constructing the lodge here, this is him, Ray, he uh, uncovered some early Mayan uh, settlement uh, evidence. So he uh, had it professionally excavated and this now has become uh, part of one of the features of this lodge, this uh, Mayan settlement here. This was a lovely uh, spot. This is the social area of the lodge. It's built above the um, uh, restaurants. And if you look over on the left here, you're looking over the gardens, look over on the right, it's all open sided. Uh, you're looking out over the rainforest here. It's got everything a naturalist could want here. We've got um, telescopes supplied. There's a library of uh, wildlife books and there's a wonderful um, honesty bar at the end. And after a day hiking through the, uh, the rainforest or wherever, uh, it's delightful to uh, just sit and have a, a beer. Now, we were talking to the owner of the lodge one night and he was saying that a few years earlier, some uh, British entomologists had come over to Belize and done some moth trapping um, uh, on the lodge there. And we, we kind of pricked up our ears at that. And uh, he was saying that uh, if we were interested, he would, they'd actually left some equipment, including a mercury vapor lamp. He said, if we were interested, he would set it up for us and we could see if there are any moths around. So um, we obviously took him up on that and, um, he set the trap up, we had our dinner, we had a, a, a bottle of beer, and then uh, uh, a fellow traveler who we became very friendly with, um, uh, Mike Brown, and I uh, went outside to have a look at what had been found. Now, Mike, I spotted is in the audience tonight, so hi, hi Mike, I'm glad, glad you could make it, and hi to Stephanie too, if she's, if she's there. These were some of the moths that we went out to find. We spent hours looking at them and photographing them. Uh, 
and then hours afterwards trying to identify what they were at home through very limited reference sources. Uh, this one was quite an easy one. This is the hieroglyphic moth, uh, Central American moth, absolutely stunner. Um, we had this moth that looks like a bit like a, one of our pale tussock moths. Uh, haven't been able to pin that one down properly. One looks like a little slice of liver and this beautiful uh, pink underwing moth. Again, I don't have a name for that one and I keep looking for it. Plenty of other moths here. Um, one that looks a little bit like our hawk moths, uh, one that looks a bit like a, a hornet mimic. Um, I was quite interested in this one, this Conchilodes moth here. I thought at first that this orange thing was its head and the antennae coming out at the side. But of course, this is actually its uh, rear end here and the head's at the top there. And it's presumably some uh, form of protection against um, uh, being attacked, hoping that the predator will go for <laughs> the wrong end, if you like. But the favourite moth, uh, my favourite moth of the lot, was this emeraldine moth. We were able to pin this one down from uh, uh, one of the uh, Moths of the World websites. Uh, it's an interesting moth. The hind wings actually at rest come in front of the forewing. So all these bristles that you see on the moth are actually on the, the hind wing of the moth. And they... Uh, when the moth's settled, if it's not on a, a bit of uh, uh, tripod stand like this one is, it would disappear completely into the foliage. Beautiful, beautiful moth, my favourite of the lot. And lots of uh, other Lepidoptera, this uh, butterfly followed us around and around and around, and you, you can see it was after the salt, it's got its tongue sticking out there on uh, a friend's finger here. Uh, this is where it gets the name, the Astella 88. These are probably the, presumably the 88. And when it opens its wings, you can see this beautiful blue iridescence uh, appearing. A red bordered pixie was actually underneath a leaf and they have their own checkered skipper too. This is the tropical checkered skipper. One of the most common uh, butterflies, sorry, was the, uh, the banded peacock. We spent a lot of time photographing these and the white peacock butterfly. And there's a butterfly sanctuary at Belize too, where they try and protect some of the rarer species. Here we have the Malachite butterfly. Uh, this is one of the glass wings. These are a little bit like the new uh, five pound, 10 pound notes. They have transparent panels in the wings. The cracker butterfly gets its name from the cracking noise that the wings make when the butterfly is in mating mode. Um, also, when they're disturbed, they, uh, they make this strange cracking noise. Um, but the owl butterfly is probably one of the most beautiful ones. We saw quite a lot of these in the wild, but this one was actually in the butterfly sanctuary. And the guardian of the butterfly sanctuary very gently picked one of these up and held its wings open. Uh, these are obviously both the underwing, and um, they really just do look like a pair of eyes. And by total coincidence, when we went back to Pook's Lodge, uh, one of the guides said to us, oh, anybody want to see a uh, spectacled owl? There's one in the forest just behind the lodge. So a number of us rushed out there, had a look at this thing. And um, the reason I'm just showing this one now, I've put next to it the photograph of the um, two eyes from the, uh, the butterfly uh, hind uh, wings there. And I just invite you to look at the similarity here. We have the black pupil, which uh, the spectacle owl has. We have the yellow iris. We have the white underneath the eye. We have something that looks like ears in about the right place for the uh, owl's ears. And we have something that looks like a, maybe a beak even down the, uh, the middle. But what really fascinated me was the white flecking on the black here. These are little white scales on the black, which mirror almost almost identically the highlights on the spectacle owl's eyes. So I, I just was totally uh, stunned by the similarity there. Uh, hummingbirds, um, plenty of hummingbirds around. Just got a, a few pictures here. The violet saber wing is uh, is a favourite of mine. It um, featured on uh, the. Uh, pointless quiz uh, the other night, which was quite nice. The white-necked Jacobin, much more common. Uh, 
look at this picture, you might wonder, well, why is it called a white neck Jacobin? It's got a blue neck, but if you see it from behind, it has this white patch on the back of its neck, which uh, gives it its name. Beautiful, beautiful bird. And um, it was so common, it would actually fly inside that uh, social area I showed you earlier and uh, perch on the lights there. The female's slightly, well, considerably different here, but still uh, quite a beautiful bird. Um, looking at some of the industrial history there, we talked about sugar being important product from Belize. This is a very old Lamanai sugar factory built in 1860. One of the things that they uh, built by the British, what, one of the things that they did with the sugar in those days was make rum with it. And uh, apparently what they used to do, they used to pay the indentured workers um, in rum rations uh, rather than with money. And I think that resulted in both the building not being built particularly well and the um, the workers spending a lot of the time asleep. So it only actually produced sugar for about 15 years, this um, uh, sugar factory before it went out of use. And now it's taken over by this strangler fig, as you can see. It reminds me a little bit about of Cambodia here, the uh, Angelina Jolie uh, a Tomb Raider kind of uh, buildings, but totally uh, taken over by that strangler fig. I mentioned Lamanai and uh, Tikal. Here's just a few archaeological pictures. Wonderful, wonderful settlements. Um, the Mayan uh, Empire lasted, well, it went for thousands of years, but the peak probably was from about 1000 BC to about 900 AD. Um, this is Tikal, this is in Guatemala, um, one of the uh, most famous temples there. This is uh, Temple One. Um, it's quite a late one. There's probably a seven or eight hundred AD um, built, uh, sometimes called the Great Jaguar Temple. And the ruler's wife is in the temple just facing that one too. Uh, lovely place to, uh, to visit. Um, I, I put this photograph up. Uh, this photograph was from uh, Mike Brown, whose photograph was infinitely better than mine of this particular thing, he's brought out the uh, the clouds uh, beautifully, given it made it very atmospheric uh, picture. So thanks very much for that, Mike. Um, one other reason I wanted to show it was if you look at Temple One that was in the previous picture, Temple Two and Temple Three. Um, it's interesting to note that it's not only us that found it atmospheric, but also the makers of the um, uh, films, the um, uh, Luke Skywalker films also found it good because they used it as a setting for one of the films there. This is one of the screenshots from Star Wars, which shows uh, the Millennium Falcon over the Rebel base. Apparently, I'm not a great uh, Star Wars fan, but um, you can see the temples uh, from the last picture, uh, one, two and three in the screenshot from uh, the Star Wars movie. Hieroglyphics uh, all over the place. Um, uh, in uh, Tikal there, uh, they've all been translated, or most of them have been translated now. This is one of the emblem glyphs um, from Tikal. It's a representation of the name of the city. And the guide that we had around uh, Tikal uh, was a very, very dedicated man, very de dedicated to his job because he'd actually had this emblem glyph tattooed onto his ankle. So uh, uh, that shows a terrific commitment to, to his job, I thought. Dave, you've probably had about half an hour now. Oh, okay, I'm on to my last one or two uh, slides, thanks. Okay, this is uh, a bird that hangs around um, Tikal uh, quite a lot. This is the oscillated turkey. Uh, the word oscillated refers to when it puts its tail up, uh, you can see eyes on the tail. Um, a little bit like a peacock's eyes, of course, that's the oscillations. But look at the plumage on this, it's absolutely beautiful. You've got the uh, blues and uh, browns here, the coppers and absolutely beautiful colours. And if you look at the head, what, what, an, what an amazing head here. Uh, it looks like it's covered in uh, coloured Rice Krispies. Um, I think this is a male, it has these blue combs, again covered with these uh, these rice crispy nodules, absolutely amazing bird. All the time you're walking around um, 
these temples, the uh, monkeys, the Central American spider monkeys, uh, quite a common one. My favourite is the black howler monkey, and you hear these howling. They uh, uh, have a terrific sound, very, very atmospheric indeed. This one wasn't actually taken at Tikal, this one was taken elsewhere, but it took a, a terrific uh, dislike to us, actually. It, uh, started ripping branches off the trees above and dropping them, throwing them, well, not just dropping them, throwing them down at us. Uh, obviously, he wasn't too pleased to see us, as you can tell maybe by the look on its face. The black howler monkey, wonderful haunting uh, howl it has. Uh, just about at the end now, just to last day or two, we spent some time again out on the um, uh, barrier reef from Dandringa. This is a little coral, coral island called Southwater Cay. Um, we spent some time snorkeling there. I didn't have an underwater camera, so I had pinched these pictures off the internet, but uh, this is our snorkeling guide here. And um, the fish, I remember vividly being very close to the lionfish, the spotted eagle rays, and the spotlight parrotfish are beautiful, as well as hordes and hordes of other uh, typical reef fish. They provided us with a lovely little chalet to uh, get changed for the swimming in. And it wasn't until we left that we kind of looked up at the roof here. And if you look at the roof, um, there's a little something going on up there and uh, zoom in on it with the camera and you see we're right underneath an osprey's nest. So an osprey had uh, uh, been breeding <laughs> right, right above us as we were getting changed. Just a few waders. Um, uh, spotted sandpiper, well out of breeding plumage, obviously. Uh, they call this the black-bellied plover. We, it's the same species as our grey plover. You can tell that big, thick uh, bill and the large eye. Uh, my favourite bird of the loss, I think, is the vermilion flycatcher. I haven't talked about passerines very much at all, really, but um, the vermilion flycatcher, this is the female. But look at the male, what a stunning, stunning bird this is. Uh, must be mine favourite of the Central American area. In terms of the more blousy birds, the collared aracari, uh, one of our guides in the previous visit said, no, they're not called aracaris, they're called arasaris. And uh, well, I tend to call them uh, arasaris now, but everybody else calls them aracaris. And they feed uh, on these fig trees. And uh, what they do is pick them off with the bills and then throw them in the air and swallow them. It reminds me of a, a chap at a bar throwing peanuts up and uh, catching them uh, in his mouth. And the final slide here is the, uh, we started out with the national flower of Belize and we're just finishing with the, nat the national bird of Belize. This is the Keelbill toucan. This photograph was taken just out of that um, Pooks Hill Lodge um, area is about eye height just in the trees behind. So uh, that was quite a pleasure seeing that. And the final slide, the end. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so that's it. So uh, anybody has any questions on either this presentation or Kate's, I'm sure we'd be uh, both happy to have a go at answering them. Anybody, any any questions at all? Of you did get um, an answer to your question, Dave, from oh, yes. Lott, who uh, who got your bird correct at the beginning. So your picture at the beginning. Your oh yes, enlargement of the uh, plumage. Oh God, <laughs> God, gosh, she God. She recognised it later on, and the answer went up as a, an oscillated turkey. Oh, excellent! Your title still at the side. So well done, well yeah. done, Beverly. Anyway, that, that was Beverly. Well done, Beverly. Yes, that's that's excellent, excellent. Oh, the... yeah. Someone's asking about uh, what camera you use, Michael Brown. Mike Brown. Oh, yeah. This is Mike, who we pulled up with actually on the trip. Um, uh, yeah, Mike, I, I had two cameras with me. One was that little um, uh, Panasonic um, 60, uh, a little compact camera that all the uh, moth photographs were taken with. Uh, the great thing about that is that um, you can get really, it's got quite a good zoom on it. It's um, 
you can get really quite close to within half a centimeter of what you're taking photographs of and you can just slip it in your pocket it's a, a great a great little camera and the flash is very close to the lens which is great for photographs like that um uh, compared with the larger cameras and the other one is the again panasonic um these were taken with the um the micro four thirds camera a panasonic uh, dz80 i think it is um but I'm a great Panasonic fan. Um, I, I love all the Panasonic cameras, including their bridge cameras. I've got a, had a couple of those over the years and um, enjoy, enjoy using them. Yeah, similarly, um, I like Panasonic as well, Dave. So uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, you've got another question here is um, from uh, Deborah Knott. Uh, why are the birds so colourful in Belize? Is there a reason for this in the rainforest? Well, it's, it's maybe because it, that's a good question, actually. Uh, why why are they so colourful? Um, I guess they're not all colourful, but I, I guess probably I've selected out the ones that are the most uh, kind of sexy looking birds, really. There are little um, discreet, more cryptically coloured birds there. But um, I guess when one isn't tremendously familiar with the birds in an area, then you tend to look at the, the brightest ones first, a little bit like any wildlife. You know, it's all the brightest moths that catch your eye rather than the, uh, the little ones. So yeah, there, there are um, duller looking birds as well. Um, whether the brightness of these is anything to do with the darkness of the uh, the rainforests, of course. Uh, I think I heard once that I think I heard once um, could you, songbirds in the north have some more complicated songs, and ones in the rainforest, their song is more uh, simpler but louder. And I think it's something to do with the, the how the sound is reflected off the leaves and the environment and travels. Yeah. So I think there's a reason for that. Well, one thing I've noticed a lot with bird sound is, though, that the more colourful and attractive the bird, the more raucous and crude the call actually is. And, uh, you know, you look at the jay, which has a beautiful bird, but a really raucous call, the pheasant, uh, yeah. all these kind of birds. But the ones with the sweetest songs are the black cap and the, the yeah. nightingale, nightingale you know, yeah. little brown jobbies rather than the... Uh, I think it's just a way of attracting a mate. You know, if you can't do it with colour, you do it with your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah. If anyone didn't see it, the David Attenborough programme on song was amazing, uh, which is on iPlayer at the moment, just as an aside. Worked very well worth watching. Uh, can't, has anyone else got any more questions? I can't see any. Some, Nice comments from everyone. Thank you very much. Just a question about the trip. Uh, okay. uh, was it a, an organised trip or was it one I did myself? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't organise a trip like that myself. We tend to use the um, bird watching tour companies and we're not here really to advertise, but I tend to use Nature Trek a lot of the time, a, a, a good company that the the guides are always top class and um it's just so much easier to get them to organize it for you and just go with the flow and just enjoy the bird life rather than worrying about when you're going to catch your next train or your next plane or your next uh, bus so no we tend to use uh, tour companies Any more questions? I can't. Um, I can't see any. Questions. No. Well, most are coming through in the chat box, actually. Let's yeah. have a... Yes, well done, the oscillated turkey. <laughs> yes, and what one? Yes, great insight into Sh Shetland here from. Uh, from who's this from Christine, is it? Re oh yeah, another one, really enjoy this, definitely want to go. Any midges, is this one for you, Kate? Any midges, did, did, oh, did you come across midges in Well, Shetland? It, it was, you do get them on Shetland, but it's usually so windy mm. uh, that that keeps them down. Um, I did have good weather, but midges were 
not too many. Mm. Um, I suppose the same question in Belize is where the many mosquitoes. I've heard the insect life is quite annoying over there, to say the least. Yeah, no, we honestly didn't have any problem with um, okay. with insects. No, we had the occasional mosquito bite, but nothing uh, really, really worrying. Um, we do tend to use a lot of DEET when we're there. And uh, just a warning to anybody that goes, it really plays havoc with your photography equipment if you get okay. it on it, actually. I I really, uh, I could never sell my uh, one of my cameras again. It got DEET all over it and all the... Yeah. Uh, DEET tends to melt, melt plastic even, so I don't it know. Does, it does, yeah. Skin. It's uh, not good, right. not nice stuff at all. No, no, but uh, actually insects, uh, no, we've not really had any insects other than the ones that you're interested in, you know, the butterflies yeah. and moths the, uh, and things like that. I must admit, I, I adored um, a lot of your moth and butterfly photographs, fantastic, particularly the, the one that looked like the spectacled owl, I thought that was fascinating. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I put together a separate presentation on eye mimicry in the animal kingdom, actually, so uh, we'll maybe uh, talk about that in a bit more detail at some time, but um, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, people say, oh, it's just a coincidence that, that it looks like an eye, you know, but uh, when you get to that level of detail, even to the highlight Oh, definitely. Yeah, then, uh, yeah. then, no, no it's, it's more than just coincidence, I, I feel. Yeah. Mm. So anyone else? Any comments? Thank, thanks to everyone who comes to listen to us tonight. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if there are no more questions, I can't see any more. Maybe we can yeah. hand, hand back to Harriet to, to wind things up then. Right, OK. Thanks then, Harriet. Could we hand hand back over to you and uh, to wind things off for us? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you, Dave and Kate. Um, some wonderful talks there, and thank you everybody who's joined us. Um, another lovely evening, um, and yes, hopefully we shall see you all again soon. We've got um, a talk tomorrow evening with the Leicestershire and Rutland Badger Group, all about otters. Um, so don't miss that one. And we've also got one on Monday with the Rutland local group. Um, and that's all about managing habitats at Rutland Water. And that's with our conservation team leader there, Joe Davis. So that should be another interesting one. Um, and the Charmwood group, you are back in February with your AGM? March. No, the AGM's March. Um, oh, sorry. We, we, we do have a, a, a date booked in February, but, well, Kate, do you just want to mention about the speaker there? Yeah, sorry. Uh, this February talk will actually be cancelled now. Um, the speaker is Brian Hammond, who has got an amazing collection of cone shells in particular. So he was quite keen to do a live talk, and I think we've made the decision because of COVID not to meet uh, face to face in February. Um, so um, the next uh, Charmwood meeting will be the March AGM with Hazel Graves doing a talk as well as the AGM. We're hoping to run that face to face, um, but please just watch the website and emails from Harriet and the Trust. Um, and please come along to um, our AGM. If you feel so inclined, we'd love another couple of people to join uh, the committee. It's not that onerous. We have some nice uh, walks ourselves and uh, a little bit of organisation here and there, but it's usually quite uh, entertaining anyway. Um, but we would like perhaps another couple of people to uh, come and join us on the committee and organise more events for the China Group. Um, so our next meeting will be the AGM. Please get in touch with myself or even John uh, Spencer by email, which you can find on uh, most of the website, I think, and uh, newsletters. Um, and hopefully see you face to face in March. Yes. And, 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 and just a final reminder, if I may, about the walk on Tuesday the 15th of February. If anybody would like to join us on that, you're, everybody's very welcome. Um, uh, again, keep an eye out on the website. The details will be on there and uh, you'll be asked to just let us know uh, if you can come or not. So that's Attenborough Nature Reserve on Tuesday the 15th of February.
yeah, that will be going up on the website. Um, should be up by next week so for people to uh, to sign up to that. And um, so yes, please just do keep checking our website. Um, we events keep coming up as we go along, so do uh, do keep checking there. And uh, yes, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we will be sharing this on on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if there's anybody who wants to watch it back, or you know anybody who couldn't make it, then please do let them know. And uh, yes, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody, and uh, good night. Okay. Um, good night. Thank, thanks very much, Harriet. Thank you.